we're going to talk about OSINT, Open Source Intelligence. And uh, before I get started, I know it sounded like we had a couple of people who are already in a SOC today or might be working with OSINT tools or techniques or anything related to OSINT. If you are working with any specific products, uh, please share them in the chat. Maybe I can incorporate some of that into my talk. Uh, the talk will be somewhat general about op open source intelligence. Um, but again, if you are using a tool, you're aware of a tool, or you had a question about a tool, just put it in the chat. And as Jonathan mentioned, this is not a webinar for me to just speak uh, as a, in a robotic form. Feel free to raise your hand. If you have a question, uh, put it in the chat or you know raise you know ask question through through audio. Happy to you know discuss that as we as we progress. So what's our agenda? We're just going to start with what Jonathan did. A little welcome to Cyber Warrior. Uh, we'll get into an understanding of open source intelligence, and then we'll sort of run through a Kahoot related to what we've discussed, what you've learned today from this masterclass, and have an opportunity for a question and answer. So you can ask during the, the sort of session your question, or you can hold it to end um, if you feel that's necessary as well. So what is OSINT? In its basic form, it's really just a method of collecting and analyzing readily public available information uh, for any type of research. And what you'll find is there's not any one tool related to OSINT, there are many tools. And there are tools that are incorporated with other tools to perform this. Some are very simple. Some you probably participate or use uh, today, like Google search is a form of an OSINT type tool. It's available open source intelligence uh, system that can glean information from and help individuals with research, hopefully for good, sometimes for other purposes. Uh, and leads us into sort of a disclaimer here. You know, this is educational only. My goal is not to teach you how to do OSINT. My goal is not to um, provide you any other means, but to provide you educational content. Um, and how you use that information is up to you. Hopefully as security professionals that we all are, you would use it for good. Again, OSINT is a tremendously large topic. And this is really an educational information session, not necessarily deep dive into OSINT. We can welcome those questions in the Q&A session. Uh, you know, and we can sort of answer them as, as appropriate as possible. So when you're working with OSINT, you should always look for a disclaimer, right? Uh, why privacy is important to consider when doing um, intelligence research or looking up information. Um, you know, simple use cases, you might look up a person through Google. You know, that that's sort of, there's a privacy related aspect to that, that individual may know certain information is available about them or may know certain information is available uh, but doesn't know the magnitude of that right so in regards to this disclaimer uh, anything you know any particular question you have about privacy or use of tools for your own research you would you seek legal your own legal advice right um, and anyone probably recommend you know if you have legal questions seek a competent attorney's advice as necessary so how is OSINT used? On the deep dark web, right? Um, most people are looking for OSINT, but it's not necessarily deep dark web. OSINT can actually be any publicly available information. So these digital footprints are left as you uh, go around or information is collected. And, you know, so that information can be useful for things like pen testing or reconnaissance related to pen testing, um, understanding, you know, vulnerabilities about network equipment, maybe performing some type of social engineering, um, threat intelligence, or anything of the like, right? It's sort of a useful research, research function. And what are the risks, you know, related to, you know, this from a practitioner's point of view? You know, sort of there's a tremendous amount of volume to process right? Um, you could call it an information explosion, if you like. I think when Google was introduced, the 
understanding was like, how does Google crawl all websites and have all information? Um, it wasn't really considered when it started a reliable source, similar to something like Wikipedia. But those, you know, over time, the perception about those tools has changed, right? Um, and, and they become really somewhat peer evaluated uh, sources of intelligent information. So good example today is during an interview process, if, if you go to an interview, you might not know the answer, but you have the know-how to say, hey, I, if I had 15 minutes to research this topic on Google, that might be a respectable response. Open source intelligence used for things like echo, echo, uh, sorry, ethical hacking and penetration testing, right? They're going to use it for identifying potential weaknesses in, you know, friendly networks and or ways that sort of they can use that information to make friendly networks more secure so they can't be exploited by threat actors. Another mechanism or another means is, you know, to use open source intelligence for identifying external threats, right? For organizations or individuals might look for active threat actor chatter on a possible active, you know, activity or one that might potentially happen in the future. Right. Um, this is a good way for security professionals to gain threat intelligence about adversarial activities. And I mentioned it a little earlier. There's surely a dark side to open source intelligence. Right. When things are designed to be used for good, sometimes we don't think about that they could also be uh, useful to someone for other uh, bad purposes. Right. So much like you know, someone might be doing some research on, you know, vulnerabilities of their organization. The same information could be available and useful for someone to exploit those weaknesses uh, to potential target networks or potential target uh, personas, right? So open source intelligence is not only information or vulnerabilities made available to find weaknesses in computer networks, computers, data. But as mentioned before, you know, you might find information that you can use from a social engineering perspective um, that allows you to achieve a variety of malicious objectives, right? So I think we just touched on this a little bit. It's not only about technical capabilities, right? Um, but it's also used to perform sophisticated in some cases or targeted social engineering campaigns, you know, not just phishing or vishing, but spear phishing um, to, for the attacker to achieve its goal. Um, so one of the things that we talk about when we're, we dive into a little bit about OSINT is tools, right? So you could do a lot of manual work related to your investigation or research, but there's a sort of slew or suite of tools available to individuals who are performing OSINT research uh, that make it easy to organize and parse information, maybe into certain categories or you know, certain groupings uh, with some capability to normalize or reduce the redundancy in that data, which could be multifold, right? Um, so that they can provide you know, valuable results to sort of target their research or help them better understand um, what they're trying to sort of find, right? To make it searchable or easily searchable in a quick manner and filtered for relevancy. Any questions so far? You know, we talk about OSINT in general and the tools, you know, in a broad sense, there's sort of two key feature characteristics, uh, sort of this passive sense and this active sense. And sort of in the passive sense, you know, OSINT could be rel relatable. If you think about newspapers in the old days, there's a, a, a slew of historical information related to uh, archives of newspapers and information about individuals, their activities, um, maybe political in nature or non-political, whatever that might be in newspapers. 
But in today's active sense, you know, you might be getting a notification of real time activity that's happening on Twitter, right? So that's all important information when someone is doing research, but the tools are sort of capable, much like uh, the technologies that are available uh, that are managing today or housing some of this information. One of those is something called Maltigo, right? You know, its claim is to simplify and expedite your investigation. Has anyone ever used Maltigo on this call? You know, it's got real useful capabilities and, you know, it sort of uh, helps to sort of provide an unbelievable amount of access and in its sense, uh, visual, visualization of that data uh, through its tool set. Same thing I mentioned before, Google, right? It's sort of straightforward and almost free. Uh, you could sort of search Google for almost any topic today even about individuals and Google behind the scenes is already doing all that OSINT intelligent work to index that information and make it relevant to your particular search. And I think there's a syntax, I don't know if everyone's really aware, there's a particular syntax that can make your Google searches much more efficient and much more targeted. Um, those are like those advanced filters that you could sort of enter. But the sort of benefit there is that work, that intelligence correlation uh, through sophisticated algorithms, it's already being done for you uh, through Google. Here's an example. You know, if you want to search on, you know, and sort of syntax related, you want to look for a topic intelligence on the cyberwarrior.com site. You know, this syntax helped you find that information or target um, that information much more quickly by utilizing the particular syntax that helps Google uh, much more you know, effective in your search criteria. You could also go to Cyber Warrior site and find that out on your own. Might be a good practice during this, this meeting to sort of go through that exercise on your own, right? Uh, you could take a minute to fire up Google, put that in and read that article and see if that helps you better understand something about cyber threat intelligence. There's also other open source tools Right, this one's called Recon NG. Uh, I'm sure there's a ton more that we could talk about. This one was, you know, pretty much started as a script for gathering some kind of technical information, and is involved into a free, you know, freely available sort of database, if you want to call it, of information related to website domains. Um, and in some sense, I think someone shared something about OSINT framework. This one claims to be a industry leading framework as well, um, it has that interface. You know, if you fire up Kali Linux, and I think it has a web application interface as well for you to use something to sort of add to your tool belt in the context of OSINT tool capability. We have tool Spiderfoot. You know, this is really more designed for investigation professionals. Um, definitely capable tool to help you perform asset discovery and as a, sort of a, an understanding of attack surface uh, monitoring or visibility. And, you know, another tool here, um, phone info got, you know, basically an advanced tool to help you scan international phone numbers. Um, you know, I'm not as familiar with this tool per se myself because there are other, you, other ones that I would readily use, but you know, you're providing really rich information about specific country, area, carrier, and line type about international phone numbers. Um, at some point in time, you know, everyone was comfortable with quickly moving to cell phones because they thought they would get less marketing calls, right? Because that your traditional phone directory um, white pages was known to any and all parties, but that sort of uh, merged and, and now cell phone numbers, cell phone ID or identification, uh, is, you know, there's a directory of that information as well because of the fact that 
individuals have left all kinds of little breadcrumbs around as footprints so that systems like um, this information gathering a phone directory can sort of put the in, you know put the pieces together much like the white pages did in the old times. Uh, Shodan, this is a pretty popular tool. I think it started, uh, it was showing available vulnerabilities and it talks to the previous sort of highlighted point where um, it's very useful for security researchers to present findings uh, so they can help companies track down their vulnerabilities and reduce you know, their overall risk. Sure, there's sort of a financial gain or, or element part of this where ethical hackers want to sort of get paid for their work. So a tool like Shodan is really your hacker's search engine for researching you know, vulnerabilities. All right, so let's sort of switch gears a little bit. Um, move on from tools, talk a little bit about uh, use cases. So there's all kinds of use cases for where OSINT tools have aided in reducing um, you know, security risks. In this case, we can talk about gift card fraud. And I'm just going to read this part from the slide, right? So we're all on the same page about the information. But similarly, in theft, information on potential and or existing gift card fraud is collected through social media, less regulated platforms as well as the dark web, right? So in this case, um, you know, this information helps the retailer to better understand fraudster strategies. Why? Because due to the relevant discussions that were occurring, um, they could do a better job of making the necessary adjustments to improve gift card security. Now, if anyone tracks any, you know, if you're a security professional, you know that if someone calls up and wants to be paid in a gift card, that's very, that's very difficult to track, right? Um, but it's sort of, it's, it's, it's a monetary, you know, monetary exchange for that uh, security person or that, that attacker because it's untrackable. It's sort of beneficial for them to use. But in this case, OSINT was very helpful and strategic in helping companies develop more capable security controls for gift card transactions. Another one was sort of like related to scams and cyber attacks. And this should be pretty straightforward. Um, you know, since OSINT tools have the ability to comb through a lot of social media and dark web data, in addition to pay sites where some breach data might be might be housed, you know, the basically, you know, where that personal identifiable, I per, sorry, personal, personally identifiable information was being hosted, um, OSINT tools were able to find that and help companies better equip their team members to respond to ind sort of indications of early data breach activities. And that's helpful because those companies who may have data breaches, the faster they can respond to that information being made publicly available, they can take the necessary steps uh, related to the incident response and if they have to do the right preparation to notify their customers and you know support them as necessary to better support their brand another sort of area is thievery and there's probably a tremendous number of examples or use cases we could talk about here but osint has the capability to gather data from marketplace listings and particularly of, of, of interest would be stolen items made for sale or other types of information you know, posted and made for sale. Um, if OSINT can notify or someone can use an OSINT tool to identify where that information is, um, this could help 
companies like a retailer in the case of this theft uh, adapt their online and store security practices more quickly might even help them with law enforcement track down these perpetrators and um, maybe get some retribution for individuals. Um, sort of another sort of use case related to OSINT was Malaysia flight MH17 um, crashed on the Ukraine-Russia border. And uh, there's a lot of activities around, you know, information about Ukraine and Russia today, but this was more related to 2014. Uh, in this case, a separatist sort of tried to claim it was shot down by Ukrainian transport aircraft. It turns out that OSINT was helpful in exposing this Russian claim and counterclaims as fabrications, right? Uh, you'll see some of the details here, um, but OSINT can be used to, to help track down um, false claims that might be out there floating around on the internet and sort of help that researcher better understand what the validity around that claim is and how to respond accordingly. So why do we need OSINT tools in summary? You know, they're helpful to ethical hacking and pen testing for sure. Right, they help law enforcement agencies, private investigators, and journalists, right, to do their their work, right, to really uh, investigate crime suspects, organizations, possible persons of interest. You know, for companies, HR professionals might even be using OSINT tools or working with, you know, some outsourced vendor who is using OSINT tools. To sort of put together, you know, a profile about potential candidates. You know, marketing and sales team might use it for strategic, uh, for more strategic reasons, even if they need to just simply check if an email address is is valid. And this is important because marketing and sales teams spend money to send email, although it's low cost advertising, but the detrimental effect of sending email to non-existing destinations lowers the credibility of their campaigns and makes it much more cost uh, ineffective unless they do some of the research uh, necessary to make their campaigns as efficient as possible. Right. And, and like we said, and like you touched on a little bit, you know, unfortunately, bad people use OSINT tools as well. And, you know, they're using some of the similar capabilities and techniques, unfortunately, in the, in the wrong manner for whether finding uh, possible exploits or putting together a cache of information for social engineering or anything in that regard. So in summary, OSINT, very powerful tool, right? And um, probably, hopefully you all have a lot of questions, but that was an introduction into the topic. And I'll turn it back to you, Jonathan. Thank you, David. Um, you know, I, 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 I want to emphasize that these are elements of cybersecurity that all levels of, of um, a professional experience hits upon. Um, OSINT is something that is, is our, our approach to OSINT in, in this program is designed to capture your attention. Um, the program itself starts at a much more foundational level and then grows from there. We start teaching you IT fundamentals and then we go into packet analysis and, and other things that are that, that, are, that are fundamental skills for cybersecurity. Um, it is not to say that people with IT background may pick up on certain uh, elements of our program more quickly than, than those without one, um, but, and, and they may not pull out their hair as much at, at, at some parts of the, of the program, um, be if they have IT background, but our, but our program is, is foundational and then it grows from there. 
Um, so, so as interesting as as many of us think this is, and I think everyone understands the the criticality of, of OSI, um, it is it is just an, an element of where you can go. A another thing that I I want to I want to I want to point to is that in cybersecurity, it, it's not like coding. In coding, coding is coding, right? <clears throat> you know what you're going to do every day of your life. You may use different languages. Um, but it, it's the same. In cybersecurity, there are literally hundreds of different career pathways that you can take in cybersecurity. We've seen a few of them mentioned in, in the in the group chat here. Um, you know, some people want to do purple team, red team, blue team. They want to be, they want to work in a SOC. You might want to work in security architecture. You might want to do pre-sales engineering, which is where you will make a phenomenal amount of money. Um there are so many de compliance. There are, our, our speaker last night um, is is in data compliance in, in cybersecurity. So there are any number of different career pathways that you can pursue. Um, the point is to find your passion, um, because this stuff is hard. If you find your passion in cybersecurity, then you're going to have a much greater chance not only be success being successful in developing the skills, but also being successful in in your job once you. Uh, once you land that first job or your fifth job or your 10th job. Um, and, and there will be many jobs because if you're good at what you do, you will be poached on a regular basis and you'll have headhunters calling you and, and hiring managers calling you say, hey, do you want to come work over here for you know, 20, 30, $40,000 a year or more? And, and sometimes you climb, sometimes you don't. Um, so what I'd like to do now, just I wanted to get that out there because um, I, I want to make sure that no one feels overwhelmed by the, by the content that, that David shared. Um, but what I'd like to do now, I'm going to introduce you to Isaac Tolentino, who is one of our teaching assistants, and he is going to walk you through what we call a Kahoot. Um, hopefully you are paying attention to the stuff, and the Kahoot is something that we do in our classroom. It initially may seem elementary, uh, because in fact, people in elementary school use, the teachers use this, this tactic to make sure that the students are, are understanding the skills, but we use it in Cyber Warrior Academy as well, so that people in a fun, friendly, yet a little bit fun, you know, enjoyable competitiveness, um, get a grasp of what they're, what, what they learned and what they didn't quite understand in real time. So Isaac, you want to, um, you want to do the Kahoot and, and see how, how, um, how you do, how you guys do. And please, I encourage yep. you to do it. It's fun. Um, it's, it, it can be anonymous. No one's going to, no one's going to know whether you get zero right or, or all of them right, but it's 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 kind of fun, and you can smile smile behind your keyboard. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, nice to meet you all. And yeah, as as Jonathan was saying, uh, one of the best ways of actually starting cybersecurity is while you enjoy it. Uh, one of and something we use for that is the cahoots, because as he said, it's like a funny way of learning. So. Uh, if it's the first time for anybody here hearing about it, um, you can enter by two ways, either through a website, just type in kahoot.it, or you can even, you can even download the app, um, through App Store or Google Play is both, is on both of the platforms and you can play through it. So as Jenison said, it's not going to be something very long. I'll put the link on the chat. Um, and it's just, you know, to get uh, to see some of the things that David was talking about, because I know he did an amazing job. Let's see how you guys do here. So I'm just going to share my screen. And here we go. So the way it works is you access it. You can see already somebody there. Uh, you access it and it will ask you for a code. I'll put that code in the chat too. Yeah, you can just put your name. I like to see some unique names. Uh, we see a tons of those in the classes. Yeah, let's see you guys joining and get this done. All right, 10 more seconds and we get started. Go five, four, three, two, and one. All right. Look to everybody. Let's see. OSINT, three, two, and one. So the first question is, what does OSINT stands for? 
what those OSINT stands for? Ooh, right away, we have a lot of answers. There we go. Right, so more seconds. And nice. Okay, I like this number. Yeah, it is open source intelligence. That was said by David at the beginning. So good job there. We have a leaderboard. Um, and the thing here is the faster you answer the right question, the more points you get. So let's see. Next question. In which field those OSINT help discover fingerprints using various cybersecurity assessments. Let's see, there's one specific field I know they've mentioned. So which one it is? And wow. Yeah, that one, that one is a tricky question. But here it will be ethical hacking. I see one um, got it. And it's because, uh, for example, pen testing, which I thought was the one going to be the top here, is a field in ethical hacking um, and also computer forensics. So in this case, um, ethical hacking is the one that um, gets all of these answers right here. So, all right. Woo. Boo is in first place. Okay, three more questions. Let's see. What is an obstacle of OSINT? That was also mentioned in one of the slides. So let's see. And information explosion that was mentioned by david when he was giving the example of example uh, of um going through google and taking information directly from it i know some of, uh i think was mario also was talking about it through the chat so yep all right so got it and this is the scoreboard but it's two more questions so let's see what is the name for people who illegally collect data for a military agency? All right. Let's see, let's see, let's see. There you go. Nice job there, espionage. But a uh, quick bonus, does anybody on the chat or that can open the mic and said uh, what this medicine stands for or what it is? Because it's, it's used a lot here in the field, but. Yep, it, it goes. Yeah, you guys, you guys are, are up there. Yeah, it's uh, just citizen of the net. So. All right. Just wanted to throw that out there. All right, so there's the scoreboard. It's, it's a really tough battle for the first place. So let's see the last question, you guys. Which of these are used to identify external threats, performing ethical hacking and penetration testing using OSINT? So it's two things in the specific that goes together. Let's see what you guys think. Five, four, three, two, and one. There you go. There you go. Good job. Techniques and tools. That's one of the things you're going to see in cybersecurity specifically or ethical hacking penetration. You, we will always be talking about those two techniques and tools. Uh, that, and that's what OSIN focuses to on gathering um, and finding that information. So. This is the podium. In third place, we got Alex. Good job. In second place, we got CP. 
And our first place, only miss one, is kudos. And kudos to you, buddy. <laughs> and also we have MG and Alden, fourth and fifth place. So thank you guys for participating. We see more of those in classes. So, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And uh, I hope we, we see many of you uh, over the course of the next few weeks and then I, and on September 5th. So have a great day. Thank you.